Welcome back, hope you're doing well. Andy here from Drive Steady, and in this video, I'm reviewing a Honda S2000. So listen up, the S2000 is somewhat of a unicorn by today's car standards. It's a lightweight, nimble, rear-wheel drive, two-seater sports car that's available only with a manual transmission. So putting that aside for a second, I wanted to address a common misconception about this car. You see, when people see the S2000, they say, oh, it's kind of like a Miata, but with a Honda badge, right? Wrong. Because for example, the Corvette, the Dodge Viper, the Prowler, and a Ferrari F355 were the only cars that had a higher power to weight ratio than the S2000, putting it in a different echelon. No offense to the Miata, I drove one recently and I loved it, but that's pretty good company. But putting all of that aside, let's see if this car lives up to all the hype in this review of the Honda S2000. common terms you're going to hear are AP1 or AP2. Really clean, classic with the wheels, uh, but it is very driver focused. The sound, the sound is what really gets you. All right, so let's start the review off and get some nomenclature out of the way. So the Honda S2000 was built from 99 to 2009, and the common terms you're gonna hear are AP1 or AP2. Now, know that the AP1 was built from 99 to 2003, and the AP2 was built from 2004 to the end of the life cycle in 2009. Now, the differences between the two, the AP1 is a higher revving engine, and the AP2 has a lower revving engine, a little bit more power, and some suspension changes to fix some of the I guess unwanted characteristics from the AP1. Some keen eyes can probably tell already, but this is an AP1. This is actually the first model year and it is an absolute pristine example. It has 69,000 miles and the paint, this red paint is absolutely glowing and it's in fantastic shape. Now, about the overall design, I think by today's standards, this is still a modern looking design. It's very clean, very elegant. It's not overly done like you see in a lot of cars nowadays. The uh, low, wide body is very, very aggressive. I like the look of the S2000 a lot. So speaking of AP1 versus AP2, one of the design things that did change between the two model years is the front bumper here. And you'll notice that there are three openings here in the AP1. Two of them are actually not functional, the ones on each side, only this uh, center section here is allowing in air. But in the AP2, it's almost like Honda said, you know what, since these aren't functional really, let me just take these two on the side and put it uh, in the middle here. You've got uh, some different slotting in the center section with the AP2. But overall, it's just a personal preference. I think both the AP1 and the AP2 front bumpers look pretty good. So now let me pop open this hood and let me give you the main differences about the AP1 and AP2. All right, so before we talk about the heartbeat of this car, the engine, one piece of information, this hood is all aluminum. It's actually very light and you can see it's held up using a pop rod style holder. There are no struts here. Further reminding you that this is a 20 year old car. So this engine, this highly regarded piece of uh, machinery, it, it's called the F20C. It's a two liter naturally aspirated double overhead cam a four cylinder engine making 240 horsepower and 153 pounds feet of torque. So that 240 horsepower, if you use your math, that's 120 horsepower per liter, which at the time, the Honda S2000 was the top of the line. It, there were no other cars that could attain more horsepower per engine displacement per liter than the Honda S2000 until 10 years later when the Ferrari 458 took the reins 
from the S2000. So this goes to show you that this is not a regular uh, engine. It's uh, kind of going along the lines of that horsepower per weight ratio as well at the outset of the video. This is kind of in a different class. Now further details about this engine, it has an aluminum block aluminum pistons which allow it to rev all the way up to 9,000 rpm. Now the closest thing at the time was a V8 found in a Ferrari that went up to 8,500 rpm so well short of what the S2000 could attain. 0 to 60 times were 5.9 seconds and a top speed of 149 miles per hour. Now this car obviously only comes with a six-speed manual transmission. It's a rear-wheel drive oriented car and a limited slip differential. Now let me come over here and show you the engine orientation or the layout of this car. So this is not a front engine car. Well technically it is but hear me out. So this is where the front axles are. The engine starts behind or is oriented behind the front axles which makes it a front mid-engine car. So this is not a general front engine layout car which gives it that 50-50 uh, weight balance that it has. So uh, cars of this size and of this orientation are highly regarded when they have 50-50 weight balance. It helps with uh, handling and the dynamics of the car. Beyond that this car weighs 2,000 almost 800 pounds which is feathery light by today's standards and especially considering that this is a convertible car. Convertible cars have more weight than the uh, coupe versions of cars in general. Now the differences between the AP1 and the AP2. So the AP2 had a 2.2 liter naturally aspirated engine so a little bit bigger than the 2 liter found in this car. The torque figure was raised by 8 and the red line was 8,000 versus 9,000. So you sacrifice a little bit in your top end red line but you gain a little Little bit more grunt down low with that 8 to 10 torque difference. Now let's go around to the back and I'll show you what the exhaust sounds like on this S2000. So there you had a chance to get a dose of what the exhaust sounds like and in my opinion it's one of the better sounding four cylinder engine exhaust note combinations. The intake noise as you'll hear during the driving portion of the review is very intoxicating. One other car that comes close as far as four cylinder engines is the Alfa Romeo 4C but the S2000 has, has its own unique exhaust tone. So uh, about the exhaust you can see that there is a two muffler dual exit design and these are real uh, exhaust. They're not fake or anything like that so back then or back about 20 years ago fake tips and all that stuff weren't as big as they are now. Anyway uh, there is a slight spoiler here. I'm not sure how much functionality there is here but it does look very nice. It's very subtle and it blends in nicely with the rest of the rear end. Now inside the trunk this is a weak point for the S2000 both on the interior and here in the trunk is that there's a very limited amount of storage space. So there's a couple ways of opening the trunk. First way there's a button on the interior in between the seats and then the more traditional way you use your key. So you put this in here and you pop that open and you are greeted with a minimal amount of space. There's kind of like a second level that you can put maybe like a larger size duffel bag but you're probably not going to be able to get in a larger piece of luggage in here. Uh, maybe a medium size but I don't know if you're if you're a light packer and you can go on a weekend getaway with maybe a medium sized carry on bag and uh, an, an extra duffel bag and such this is fine for a weekend getaway on a day to day basis I don't know it's a little bit of a stretch you can you can put some grocery items in here but it's not uh, the roomiest of trunks let me put it to you that way. So now let me close the trunk and let me take you around to the side and show you how the convertible top operates. 
All right, so now you're looking at the side profile of the S2000. And before showing you where, how the top operates, I forgot to mention something about the trunk. So when this top is down, you do not sacrifice any trunk space, which is always an added bonus. Certain cars nowadays, you do sacrifice trunk space with the top being down. So that's always nice. Now, the top operation, it's actually quite finicky. You have to unlatch these two pieces, one on each side of the car. And then there are two additional measures you have to meet. The car has to be in neutral and the parking brake has to be engaged. If both of those things are not met, then the top will not operate. This is a safety measure, safety measure that uh, Honda, I suppose, has put in place. But let's say you've got all the requirements met. You pull down on this lever here and the roof will retract. Now, the nice thing about the roof, it opens and closes in six seconds which is extremely fast you don't have to sit around waiting for this thing to operate even some modern day cars don't even get into the single digits when you talk about opening and closing the convertible top now there is a disadvantage with this convertible top and you may have already gotten to this conclusion considering that you can't operate the top without the uh, handbrake or the parking brake being engaged and that is that this car has to be completely stationary in order for this top to work yes uh, there are certain cars nowadays that up to 35, 37 miles an hour, the convertible top operates, but not in this S2000. You have to be completely stationary with the parking brake engaged in order for the top to operate. So that's how the top operates. Now let me show you the wheel, tire, and brake package in this S2000. All right, so now let's talk about the wheel, tire, suspension, and the brakes. So starting off with the suspension, this is a all control arm, double wishbone suspension. So Honda is very famous for the suspension on this car. Moving to the wheels. So these wheels are actually a very clean, classic looking wheel. There's nothing more I like than a simply designed clean looking wheel and this S2000's five spoke wheels match that bill. So they're 16 inches on all four corners. They're by six and a half up front and by seven and a half in the rear. As far as the tire goes in stock form, 205 in the front, 225 in the rear. Now going inside the wheel barrel, there is no carbon ceramic, nothing fancy going on here. This is a very light car anyway. So they're 11 and a half inch brakes uh, up front and I believe 11.7 in the rear and nothing too fancy fancy going on, no painted calipers, none of that stuff. So now let me jump on the inside and let me give you a tour of what's it like in there. All right, so now the interior portion of the review and you can see that I've got the top down uh, because it is kind of hot today and it just feels better this way and I'm in the shade. So anyway, let me give you uh, an overview of what this interior is like. This is obviously not a modern interior. It's a 20 year old interior, probably designed 25 years ago, uh, but it is very driver focused and extremely simple. Uh, and those are good things when you come into a car like this where it's very driver oriented. Uh, the experience is all about the driving. There are There isn't anything fancy or electronically savvy going on in here. So let me give you some uh, details on the experience. So starting off with this seat. So this seat is surprisingly very comfortable. Uh, there isn't a lot of adjustments. It's not very aggressive. Uh, so you have the forward and backward and your backrest goes forward and backward. Other than that, no other adjustments, but it is surprisingly comfortable. It's surprisingly not as aggressive as I thought it would be. So um, yeah, that's the seat. Now let me talk about the steering wheel. The steering wheel is oval. It actually reminds me a lot of a, um, a racing steering wheel, I believe Logitech G25. And I remember it because I wanted to buy one of those things. And this thing reminds me a lot of that for some reason. Uh, but anyway, it's a very simple wheel again, no paddle shifters, obviously, because this is a manual transmission. Moving to the gauges. Now, if you wanted to say there's a lot of tech in here or a technology oriented piece, it's right here in the dash. So you have a electronic speedometer and tachometer, which was advanced for the year 2000 or 99. And a nice thing about it is that it still works. So if you're somebody who's trying to buy a car that's this old, you're always concerned about the technology. And I'm glad to say that the gauges work perfectly fine. Otherwise, the climate controls, everything is put right here in front of you. The driver's side basically gets no action. So one interesting thing about how you turn this car on and off. So you hop in, foot on the brake, clutch in, 
uh, turn the ignition on and then there's a start stop button but it says engine start so keep that in mind you push that engine turns on so when I first sat in this car I thought oh well I just go ahead and push that same button and the car will turn off wrong that's not how this car turns off so remember this said engine start it is not engine start stop so in order to turn the car off, you have to use the traditional method of turning the ignition off and then pulling the key out. So keep that in mind when you're experiencing the S2000 for the first time on how to turn the engine on and off. All right, now the rest of this interior and as far as infotainment, and it's almost laughable that I use that word because there isn't uh, any technology in here. Uh, so let me describe it. Uh, there's a cover here. You open that up and you have a single disc CD slot mind-blowing and then you have an am fm radio general radio functions uh, other than that that's pretty much all you've got no bluetooth no screens none of that stuff so then you come down you have a six-speed manual shifter which i'll talk about during the driving portion of the review all right so now the storage topic on the interior there is no center armrest section where you can just lift open simply and put your stuff in there there is no glove box there are no storage areas on the doors the only places where you've got a decent amount of room something where it's more than a cup holder size is there's some netting here on the passenger side and there's a center section right here in between the two seats. So this is where the button is to open the trunk. And then you also have a upper section here that you can open up that uh, gives you two more containers of storage. Now, the thing about the storage orientation of the S2000 is that not that it's extremely lacking. There's, I mean, if you combine this whole area, all these areas that I'm talking about, you can probably fit a decent amount of stuff. In my opinion, I think it's inconveniently placed. Uh, putting this thing in the center here means I got to turn around and then this upper section means I got to turn around even further and open it up. If it was just here in the center armrest or in the door pockets, I think it would have been a lot more convenient, but that's just me nitpicking. So let me give you an overview of the interior in general. This is a very simple place to be. It's very driver focused. Uh, it, there's very little technology, if any, and in my opinion, when you're in a car that is purpose-built like the S2000 is, that's good. Uh, I wish there was some Bluetooth to stream audio, but nonetheless, uh, that's something that you can pass because just listen to the intake and the exhaust noise. As far as space goes, I don't feel claustrophobic in here with the top up or the top down. I feel like two people would fit just fine in here. I wouldn't bump into the person next to me. And I felt the same way about the new Miata as well. So that's basically the interior of the S2000. Now let's go to the driving portion of the review and let's see how this thing goes. All right, so now the driving portion of the S2000 review. And as always, it's a regular key, so I can't complain about it. It's just the uh, key and the spare key, and this is the keyless entry that locks and unlocks the doors for you. Uh, but remember, you still have to use the key to turn the ignition on. Now, as far as visibility goes, I have a very short hood in front of me, and it's fantastic. I don't have to worry about anything with the top up. Uh, I don't have any blind spots. <clears throat> the top uh, material in the back is kind of worn out so it's a little difficult to see out of the back but that's a little expected considering the age of this car but with the top down obviously there are no issues in visibility all around you uh, this car does not have a rear view camera uh, but nonetheless that's fine i don't mind it whatsoever now as far as price goes this car was i believe twenty five thousand dollars when it was new which converts to roughly forty four or forty five thousand dollars in today's money new so it's quite a bit expensive or more expensive than a mazda miata and i believe tipping on the toes of the z4 bmw z4 anyways let's go ahead and turn this thing on and let's go for a drive remember key in the ignition Foot on the clutch, clutch in, turn the ignition on, engine start stop. I should say engine start, not stop. Remember, uh, I was telling you, in order to turn the car off, you have to turn the ignition off. It doesn't turn off with that start stop button. Anyways, seat belt on. And one thing about the shifter, in reverse, you push down, and then the shifter all the way to the right, and down speaking of the shifter 
it actually has a great feel it's not too notchy and uh, it's not too jello-y for the lack of a better term and it feels great to shift this car this is one of the better shifters that I've used in any car so let's see if I could I'm just gonna give this a roll and let's go Pretty good, pretty good. It's not the fastest car, but with that high red line, it does very, very well. All right, rolling. The sound, the sound is what really gets you. It's, it's addicting actually, let's go. Come on, give me gas. It loses traction in second and as far as the speed goes this is not a very knock your socks off car this is an experienced car with the high red line and the sound it makes it very engaging to drive let me close the windows and get some wind noise out of here but this is not an extremely fast car by any stretch of the imagination this is a feel car you have to feel the power and make the whole uh, or take in the entire experience of the intake noise the exhaust the engine noise everything works together to make it feel a little faster than it actually is and this is a very similar feeling or similar characteristic that you get in the Mazda Miata as far as the other components go the brakes are actually pretty good I could see why people don't mind the braking performance considering that the brakes in this car aren't the biggest or don't have the most pistons or the biggest slotting or the venting so rev match downshifting is very very easy in this car as well Contributing to that shifter feel. The shifter gets better the faster you drive. This is a very engaging shifter to use. I like it a lot, a lot. As far as the suspension goes and the feel, the balance, this is an extremely balanced car. It feels very nice when you're driving it in twisty roads in the canyons. I drove it a little bit off camera and I don't have the ability to uh, drive around on a closed course or anything. And during the day, there's a bunch of traffic, but I can tell you that it's a very well, nicely balanced car. The handling is very neutral. It feels like it's on rails. You can really tell that this is a lightweight package, very nimble on its toes. But overall, what are my thoughts on this S2000? Very similar to when I drove the Miata, my thoughts were, oh, it's just a slow little car uh, that the top comes down. And what's so exciting about it? And when I drove the Miata, it completely changed my perspective. And this is in a different category, like I've said. The red line and the sound, the audible experience of this car, make it an extremely fun car to drive. Uh, this is probably one of the funner cars I've driven uh, because of that experience with the exhaust, the intake, and the engine noise. And to add on with the convertible top experience, it just takes it over the top. Considering the price of these cars, I wouldn't hesitate for one second if you had your daily driver car and you wanted to buy one of these as a uh, weekend toy car, uh, obviously as a track car, they're very competent, uh, but no complaints here. The only thing is the practicality, obviously it's only a two-seater and it doesn't have a lot of storage space, but if you can get over those two things, Man, this package is very, very compelling. 
and the red line it really really wakes up after 6,000 rpm so it's a very very pleasurable experience when you are driving it up to that red line but those are pretty much my thoughts on the Honda S2000 if I didn't answer your questions please leave me a comment below or send me a direct message on Instagram at drivesteady otherwise thank you for watching this video until next time drive steady